Well, we are in the series on Elijah, which again is uh, this name means Yahweh, the Lord of Israel, the God of the Bible is my God. And um, this is the question we've been asking ourselves is who is your God? It's on our marquee even outside as people drive by the church. Um, it's a question we don't always think about, but it's a question that if we're honest, we all answer in one way or the other. And if we're honest, the answer to that question actually affects every way that we live. Because if you are your own God, then you decide what to do, and you do this, and you do that, and the pride of your heart and the selfishness of your actions causes you to be a certain way, to do certain things. If there are other elements that are gods in your life, maybe fame or popularity or money could be a god in our life, then we do everything we can to get more of it, you know? The question is to all of us, who is our God? And I challenge us even as a church to be thinking that even as Bible reading, uh, gospel preaching people, we can have a wrong answer to that because we are answering it from our perspective, not based on the truth of Scripture. This is what Adam's emphasis even on Sunday nights to do is let's open up the Word of God and let God's Word preach. This is what we need in our world even today because if I'm honest, even as somebody raised in the church, somebody that could answer all the Bible trivia questions, I can start to make God a little bit in my image or start to be angry at God because he does certain things that I would not want him to do. But no, church, we are not pursuing a God that we are curious about. God has revealed himself to us. He has given us his word to say, here's who I am. <laughs> and we have his word to learn about him. But we even in that know that the Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts higher than our thoughts, and so we cannot fully know him. We will one day see him face to face, and even then he'll be too big to fully know. We need an eternity <laughs> to get to know our God. But he's given us enough, enough to be held accountable, enough to be confident in the truth. And that's what we'll look at even this morning. Well, we do live in a world of opinions. Some of them might be in this way. If I asked you to raise your hand or to jot down your, the best burger in town, some of you would have an opinion. You know, you'd be like, I, I like Culver's or, you know, I like McDonald's. My son tends to like that one. I'm not sure why, but we have some opinions about these things. Different people would vote different ways. Some people have an opinion even this morning about whether you would rather have coffee or whether have tea. Which one do you like better? Which one is your favorite? We can have opinions about these things. And those opinions are not all wrong. I mean, whatever you choose is your choice, right? Somebody will have, some people would even have opinions about would you rather spend a week on the mountains or a week on the beach? And these are your choice, your decision. It's not wrong. It's just whatever you prefer. The same reality even exists in the Chicago baseball decision to say, would you rather cheer for the White Sox or for the Cubs? And as many of you that are out there that would say the opposite people are wrong, it's truly an opinion. It's truly your upbringing or what you were taught to believe or even just which colors you like better, red, white, and blue for America or black and white for the Sox. Like people have their patriotic connections to these teams. Well, church, we have an understanding that even the Cubs wear white socks. And so the reality is, is that there is opinions. But there are things that are opinions that are actually grounded in truth. For example, this was a big one back in 2015. People asked this question, and I know some people are colorblind, so this is not a judgment on you for that. But there was this dress that was put on the internet, and the question was asked, is this a dress that is black and blue, or a dress that is white and gold? And if I were to ask you in this room, some of you would actually answer one or the other, and the people can't believe that the opposite is even possible, but your eyes, your perception can actually see this dress in two different ways. But a woman actually wore this dress on a talk show in 2015, and look what it... Tell me if you have a more confusion in regards to what this color is. And so there's like, well, I have an opinion, and my opinion actually was right, or whatever. But there is actually a truth. The, the dress is not two colors. It's either one or the other, right? It is your perception might be different, but the truth is certain colors were chosen. Certain dyes were used to make this dress. It can't both be white and gold and blue and black. It has to be one or the other. This happened also in regards to a color of the shoe, this is a, a van shoe, and people ask, is this teal and gray or pink and white? And as I look back at the one on the back here, I see both. I can actually make my eyes see teal and gray 
Or if I look at another part of it, I can see pink and white. But if you look at the actual catalog for this shoe, it's obviously pink and white. There is no teal and gray. Next slide, yep. See, so there's no teal and gray. But there are filters. There are things that people can do to pictures to add a little bit of a blue to it, right, to change the perspective. But church, again, this is an opinion based on truth because the shoe can't be both colors, can it? I mean, the picture can perceive in different ways, but the truth is one or the other. So there are opinions, but there are opinions that are rooted in truth. Here's the last one. Is this a bird or a goat? Now, you can have perception, you can have opinion, okay? But let's zoom out on this picture because the internet does a great job of cropping. Now answer the question, is this a bird or is this a goat? Okay, next slide. All right, what about now? Now, you get feathers and you get a branch and all of a sudden it can't be a goat, right? I mean, you crop it just a certain way and it looks like the, the back of the, the, the bird's head is the mouth and the beak of the bird is the ear. And I, I get how you can see a goat, but when you have the right perspective, it's clearly not a goat. Now, church, the, the world does this all the time. They crop the realities of the perspectives. They only show you what they want to show you. They want you to just have enough to be able to skew your opinions about things. But, church, there are opinions about stuff that it's just your favorite flavor of ice cream that there's not a wrong answer to. But when we say something is, it is a truth statement that your opinion can either be right or it can be wrong. And to that, that's where I say that there are numerous opinions but an extraordinary, extraordinary truth. And this is where we're going to look at what happens today with the prophets of Baal and Elijah on top of Mount Carmel. So if you're able to this morning, please stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 through the end of the chapter 46. And again, some of us are not able to stand the whole time. That's okay. Sit down. The Lord understands. Stand with your heart. We revere that this is not just me reading some text. This is the holy word of God. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20 reads, So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. And all the people answered, It is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourself one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar and, that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, crying, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or... He is on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two seahs of seed, and he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. 
And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. And he bowed himself down to the earth and put his head between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I've told many people this is one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. Um, It really is a declaration of who is God. I want to emphasize this morning some points, but before I do so, let us pray. God, if we're honest this morning, we come to you believing that you're God, but maybe like the people of Israel, limping between options and opinions. And God, I pray this morning that you would remind us, declare the reality that you alone are God. You say in your commandments that we shall have no other God besides you. So Lord, I pray that you would purify us to worshiping you alone. But God, in a world of all these opinions, help us to see the extraordinary reality of the truth found in you and in your word. Lord, may it not only affect what we believe, but may it change how we live, how we respond, and who we worship. God, this morning I pray over the people that are within the hearing of my words, both in this room and online. God, I pray that we would come before you humbly, seeking that you would reveal truth to us even this morning. And give us the boldness to respond to the evidence that you show us in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, um, I won't spend a lot of time on them, but I have five points from this text that I need to make for you, okay? The first one is that truth demands a decision. Truth demands a decision. We, when we face truth, we can't just go on not thinking about it. Let me bring this home real quick with an application before we look at the text. If a doctor tells you you have a certain condition, you have to decide what to do about it. If a mechanic says a certain part of your car is wrong, you have to decide to fix it or not fix it. There's no lacking decision when truth is given. Truth comes and you decide. Indecision is decision. <laughs> There is no Switzerland when it comes to responding to truth. It demands a decision. So look at what he says in verses 20, 21. So Ahab gathers the people of Israel, all of them, and the prophets at Mount Carmel. And Elijah asks them this question, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. 
But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Now, church, the reality here is this idea of limping. It's actually used later with the, the worship attempts of the Baal prophets. It's best described, in my own understanding, as like a fish out of water. Just flailing around, just hopelessly where it is. If you've ever caught a fish and it's been taken off the hook and it's just sitting in the grass, it's just flip-flopping all over the place. And that's what these people are doing in their theology and their worship. Some days it's God of Israel. And today I feel a little bit more like Baal and they're just flopping from one to the other and it's pointless. It has no meaning, but it's what they're doing. They're just switching from one to another and staying and switching and it is chaotic and it is pointless and it is sinful. So he says today, decide, pick one. Now again, the people are not solely worshiping Baal. They're not solely worshiping the Lord. And so this challenge of pick one, notice they do not answer him a word. They don't like this reality because if we're honest, we like the freedom of choice in our human nature. We like the freedom to change our mind. Isolating so just one thing is really hard for us because then I can't get out of that into something else. I, I like the options, and the people would prefer to have this polytheistic opportunity to say, God of Israel, God of Baal. What about, what about the God of the Canaans? And what about the God of the Romans? And let's just bring them all in. Let's have our choices because we want to have the privilege to choose. So they don't answer my word because this is uncomfortable. And maybe even the hearing of my word, my own self-included church, we don't like to be limited to just one thing. We like to have our choices. <laughs> but Elijah tells the people, that's not how it works. Pick God or pick Baal. You cannot have both. And he forces them to decide. Well, the second thing we see about truth is that truth is worthy to be tested. There's no concern of Elijah to bring the deities of the, of the people of this community under examination. Let's put them to the test. And you should have no fear about the truth. Preston referenced it, that people will challenge you in your truth because, church, the truth will prevail. That's the point coming later. But the reality is we need to test it. Truth needs to be tested. It doesn't have to be believed blindly. It needs to be put to the test. And so Elijah sets up this test. He says... I am the only prophet left of the Lord. Now, again, we know from last week that there were prophets hidden, a hundred of them, into the caves. Remember, Obadiah did that? He hid the prophets of God and he fed them. But they're hiding. They're not at Mount Carmel. So Elijah is in isolation as the only one who only worships the Lord on this mountain. But he references there being 450 prophets of Baal. We don't know this, but it's likely that these prophets were of Israel's people. Remember Jezebel, uh, the king's wife, brought Baal worship into Israel and probably trained people to be prophets. These were not necessarily prophets from another country. These would have been people that could have been from within themselves, but they were prophets who gave all they had to Baal. These are not flip-floppers. So you have Elijah, who's not flip-flopping, worshiping the Lord of Israel. You have the prophets of Baal who are not flip-flopping. They're only worshiping Baal. They have their option. And so these are devout followers of their gods, representatives of their theology, representing these religions. So he puts this test before them of let's prepare an altar. Uh, let's get a bowl and some wood, but don't put fire to it. I'll do the same thing. Call on your God, and I'll call on my God, and whoever answers, he is God. And look what happens in verse 20, 24 at the end. The people answer to this, it is well spoken. So they didn't have a word at all about you have to choose, but they love the idea of there being evidence to make a choice. True in your life? I'd love for God to just show up. God, if you're real, then come down fire from heaven. I'll believe. This is an understandable reality for these people. Now, in my study, um, there's record that was outside of the Bible, historical record, that Baal prophets would at times have somebody from their own um, group, an intern, a prophet or something, be under a fire and would actually light the fire from underneath. That there'd be times whenever they would pray to their God and it would look like fire would come. 
that he would receive it. And that person would often die of suffocation from the smoke of the fire. There'd be no evidence that anybody else lit it for them. But Elijah challenges them, don't put fire to it. I won't put fire to it either. Let's let the gods decide. Now remember in Israel's history, because we are in Kings, Exodus has already happened, God led the people as what? A pillar of fire by day, or by night, and a cloud by day, right? But this is not a new thing. In fact, it talks about, um, he said it there, the name of the Lord, verse 24, who answers by fire, <laughs> right? And he, he knows that his God is going to answer this, but he gives it to the people of, let's just see who does. But Elijah's not afraid to let this be tested. He's not afraid to put his God before the people, and he knows what's going to be the outcome. I mean, he believes that his God will show to be true, because truth deserves to be tested. What we see continuing on is that the opinions of man, the false things that are there, are revealed as failing the test, right? The things that are that are not true will fail when tested, right? This is true in your own life, that if, if you have things like, um, oh, this is a strong, it'll hold a certain amount of pressure on the wrench, and the wrench breaks, then it's not able to do that, right? It's not true. And in fact, in the Bible, we're told to test prophecies by whether those prophecies come true, right? The, the things that are true should not crumble, should not fade away. If it's really true, then it should remain, but the failed things of the opinions of man don't. These people are devoutly pursuing their God. They're preparing the altar. And in 26, it says they take the bowl and they prepare it. And from morning until noon, they say, Oh, Baal, answer us. And I believe that their call in that way was devout. It was believing that he would. But there was no voice. No one answered. And then in the text there, it says they limped around. This is the same limping around that we see about these opinions. They're just kind of chaotically dancing and trying to get the attention of their God around the altar. And at noon, he, Elijah mocks them. I would not advise you as young people to use this at your school. Don't mock the teachers that are unbelievers. Don't mock your friends that are unbelievers. But, but Elijah's like challenging them to say, hey, like, Maybe try a little harder. Turn up the volume a little bit. Don't, don't walk away from here saying, if only we would have. Do, do all that you can to call on your God, because when he doesn't answer, I want you to say all resources were spent. So, so call a little louder. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he wants to relieve himself. Maybe he's in the bathroom. A church, the beauty of what this is, is Elijah is speaking to these people in the way that they understand because they understood their God in human terms. Human people depart on a journey. Human people go to sleep. Human people need to use the restroom. And so Elijah speaks to these people that are pursuing Baal in the way that they've made their gods in their own image. I said this last week, the God of the Bible, we are made in his image. The gods of the world, they are made in our image. So he asks them to pursue him as you would pursue a king, as you would pursue a man. Call louder. They cut themselves as they would do to, to dis display their sacrifice to the kings that maybe blood would be what they would want. And there are many of these gods that would require child sacrifice. But it's chaos. It's Make a lot of noise so that the God will hear us. It's the kid with the pots and pans and the parent comes running because commotion will get the attention of a God in our image. But at 29, midday passed, they rave on until the offering of the oblation. No voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Silence. failed the test. Now, the hope of the prophets of Baal would be then that Elijah will also fail the test, right? I mean, it's one thing for you to fail when somebody else passes, but if everybody fails, I used to be a teacher. If everybody fails, we retake the test. We curve the test so that nobody has to fail. Let's make sure that he fails too. I'm excited to see what happens with Elijah because we failed, maybe he'll fail too, and their curiosity would hope that his would also not be true. So the third thing, um, 
the fourth thing, rather, is that truth does prevail the testing. Elijah says to the people, come. Notice the order of Elijah's worship. He takes 12 stones and he places them and he's very orderly. He cuts the oxen into pieces and he digs a trench. This is not a chaotic worship. Our God doesn't need to be shown this extravagant devotion to him. No, God has described what he wants. What does it say? He doesn't even want sacrifice. He wants a contrite heart. And so Elijah's preparing of the temple was also preparing himself. Because God is not excited about what you're going to give to the church in your tithing as a proof of your love for him. He's not going to care about how much hours you spend working in the nursery at a church to prove your love for him. God sees the heart. It's not about the altar that you prepare. It's not about how great the offering is. He sees the heart of the one doing the sacrifice. And so Elijah, man of God, proven so through the stories you've already looked at, repairs the altar orderly puts up the stones, and he sets this offering on the wood. But then in 32, we would say that's enough. Um, Why does he have to add water? Um, If any of you like to do bonfires, you would know that getting your wood wet is not good camping mentorship. If, If I told you to go soak your wood in the bathtub and then take it out to light a fire, I would be foolish. You would not sell a lot of copies of Sportsman's Guide, new article of how to light a better fire. We know that water and fire don't mix. Water and fire don't go together. But church, what this is doing is this is also eliminating the reality of the trickery that happened within the other worship. That they're not, what you do to light fires is not what I'm going to do to light a fire. (laughs) What you do to dissuade your people to the powers of your God, I cannot do that. I mean, you couldn't even light a fire on a wet altar of wood. So he creates a situation where it has to be God, you have to show up. But also in obedience to what God had called him to do. So he fills these jars with water and he pours it. And it's so wet at the end of verse 35 that the water is filling the trench. But look what happens when Elijah calls out to the Lord. Verse 36. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Now, I love this, because this is priority one, prove yourself. (laughs) Priority one, bring glory to your own name. But priority two, make sure that people understand that I'm on your side. (laughs) Make sure people know that what I'm doing is for your glory. But then look at priority three at the end of this prayer. At the end of 37, he says that you have turned their hearts back. His third priority is repentance of the people, a coming back to the Lord. He doesn't want through this for the people to be judged and destroyed. No, he wants them to have a repentant heart turning back to their maker. Then 38, look what happens. The fire of the Lord falls and consumes the ox, the offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licks up the water. Our God's fire is a consuming fire. (laughs) It doesn't consume the, the bush whenever he talks to to Moses, but in this case it comes and it takes up everything, even the dust. There was no question what had happened. God had come down and received this offering. And how do I know that? Because look in 39. People see it and they fall on their face and they say, the Lord, That's the capital L-O-R-D, which is the holy name of God in your Bible, if you look at it in the Hebrew. Yahweh, he is God. (laughs) Yahweh, he is God. 
the God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, the God of Elijah, the God of the Israelites, the God out of Egypt, the God who created the world, the God who has revealed himself to Moses through the Ten Commandments, the God who has given us his word. He is God. It's a declaration of the people who see what happened on top of Mount Carmel. But church, if I can be honest, uh, some of us in this room would say, if only God would be so bold to give me such a great testimony. <laughs> Let me remind you, the same people who God called out of Egypt, who walked through the Red Sea, months later said, let us go back. The human heart is not changed by mountaintop experiences. Let me say that again. <laughs> The human heart, the faith we have in God, is not established in mountaintop experiences. It's established in the day-to-day, -day, his faithfulness in times when you're struggling, his lifter of your head when you're crying yourself to sleep. God has some mountaintop experiences. What happened on that cross is an amazing thing. But church, you didn't have to be on the mountain to have the faith you have today. We've been given such a great cloud of witnesses as it talks about in Hebrews. And what we have in the Bible is a great reminder, but the faithfulness God has had in your life is worth responding to. The truth of his reality in our world has been tested in your life, and it proves true that there's a God who knows you, a God who cares about you, a God who wants you to strive in his life, a God who gives you his word so you can better get to know him. We do not have a God who wants to be held at a distance and held in a mystery. No, he reveals himself in Scripture and came down on this earth to live as a human being through Jesus Christ. Our God wants to be known, Amen. confidently known. And that truth demands a response. But that truth is not ruined by the testing. There are many examples of people that went out to disprove God. One of the most famous, Josh McDowell writes, the new uh, evidence that demands a verdict, and he goes out to try to disprove God. C.S. Lewis did the same thing, and they become believers because when you knock, the Bible says the door will be open to you. When you seek, the Bible says that you will find. And so one of the best walkaways I can give everybody here is test the truth. Don't rest in it not being tested, because when you test it, I know the truth will prevail. I know that his word will remain. <laughs> Let me speak a little bit about this chaos, going back to the idea of uh, the false things failing. Um, because we live in a world that just wants to have the opinions. Why, why does it have to be that your truth is the truth? Why can't it just be true for you? and then not true for me. So let me give some examples of how that thought process in the world we live in today just doesn't work. Let's say today when you're going home, you come up to a red light and a green light, and you have the green light. But somebody coming in the other way says, uh, red light doesn't mean stop for me. Can you imagine the chaos in our world if people did not accept the truth of the laws in which we live, and me on a green pass through, and them on a red pass through as if it's green, the chaos of that intersection is a sample of what life would look like with opinions ruling the day. What about the opinion of, I can do whatever I want. I can have sex with whoever I want. I want to have sex with an animal. And we say, no, that's wrong. Well, who are you to tell me it's wrong? Well, then you ha can't get mad at people for child molestation because they're doing whatever's right in their own eyes, right? I mean, this is a, a crazy, terrible world that we live in. What about if I said that you went to uh, the dentist and you walked out with a $20,000 bill because they just felt like it was best to charge you $20,000? I mean, can we live in a world without structure? Imagine the chaos. Chaz in Oregon was an example, and Washington was an example of that. Let's have a society with no laws. And what they do, they built walls and gave their authorities guns and they developed structure because a world without structure is a world in chaos. <laughs> do what's right in your own eyes. We need to have communal understandings of what is true because it structures our world to work in unison, in community. 
Well, finally, we see that God's word, because he's true, is authoritative. God being true, as described even by this passage here, demonstrates that there is something that must be done in obedience to him. A lot of us, if we're honest, would love this story, cutting out verse 40. Why do the prophets of Baal have to die? God already turned the hearts of the people. Why does there have to be execution of people on the other side? And the only comfort I can give you is that God had given them this command in Deuteronomy chapter 13. If you'll turn there, this is worth reading, worth understanding, because this is what God had told them to do, and they obey his words. So Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 11 reads, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk so you shall purge the evil from your midst. If your brother, the son of your mother or your son or your daughter or the wife you embrace or your friend who is at your own soul entices you secretly saying let's go and serve other gods which will neither you nor your fathers have known some of the gods of the peoples who are around you whether near you or far from you from the one end of the earth to the other you shall not yield to him or listen to him nor shall your eye pity him nor shall you spare him nor shall you conceal him but you shall kill him your hand shall be first against him to put him to death and afterward the hand of all the people you shall stone him to death with stones because he has sought to draw you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery and all Israel shall hear and fear and never again do any such wickedness as this among you. Church, ultimately we have to say that God is just. That God knows all things and judges people rightly. And I'll tell you right now, to die on this earth is not the, the punishment people should be afraid of. I mean, let's say that these prophets of Baal repented and believed that God was the true God of Israel. And they said, I cry out that I don't want Baal anymore, I want you. And they still were executed. I will see them, if that's the reality, I will see them in heaven forever alive because of what God did. Their being killed on this earth was not an eternal punishment if their heart was willing to repent and call out to God. But it was an example. And if we think about the three years of drought, I would ask the question of how many people died because of the lack of water in the land? How many people in the midst of this judgment of idolatry have lost their children like the widow and her son were an example of because there was not enough food for them? These prophets of Baal, these men who distorted what the people should do and promoted them to worship God, have led to the death of other people and are now executed under the commandments of the Lord. I don't think that God desires that any would perish. The Bible says that. But there are consequences to the sin. Jesus even says, better that you tie a millstone around your neck and drown than lead one of these little ones astray from him. Now, he's not asking you to go commit suicide. But oh, the responsibility of dissuading people from the Lord. Oh, the responsibility for anybody who takes a pulpit of the Christian church and teaches things that are not biblical. I mean, I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, God, I thought that it was best if I tell them this, even though your word says that. I, I don't want to be in that audience under the Lord whose word is true. So these prophets of Baal are seized and they are killed. And then I love how it ends here. Look how Ahab, this king of Israel, this one who rules all things, now is listening to Elijah. Look at 41. Elijah says, Go up and eat and drink, for there's a sound of rain. 
So Ahab went up to eat and drink. Now Elijah, this man of God, is one who has authority or at least is respected, even by the king, that when Elijah says, go and eat, the king goes and eats. When Elijah says, go and drink, he goes and drinks. Because the king sees true power in the man of God. But why is he doing this? Because God said rain would come. Look at what it says even in 1 Kings 18, verse 1. Because God said, go show yourself to Ahab and I will bring rain upon the land. Remember that? God said it. It must be true. So what happens? Rain comes. Elijah actually in 42, he's praying. He's on Mount Carmel and he's bowing to the earth. He prays multiple times and he tells his servants seven times to go and look. And on the seventh time he finds rain. Church, if you turn real quick to James chapter 5, there's an interesting verse that I think is helpful here. In James chapter 5, I don't think it's on the screen. It talks about what Elijah did. Chapter 5, verse 17. Write it down for later reference. James chapter 5, 17 reads, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain for three years and six months, and it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Church, God utilized Elijah's prayers to stop the rain and to bring the rain. But I love how Elijah even said earlier that he's done everything as the Lord has asked him to. Building the altar, calling people to Mount Carmel, going to visit the widow, going to the cave to be fed by the ravens, declaring no rain. Elijah is obediently an ambassador of God's message to the people. And then it ends with a little miracle. Uh, This older man, we don't know his age, but uh, he tucks his garment into his cloak and he runs and he outruns a chariot all the way to Jezreel. (laughs) Now, the reality is that our God doesn't need to help us. He doesn't need to show miracles through his people, but he likes to. And um, what happens next, actually, Elijah's prepared because next week's sermon is... uh, a forgetful man of God or something like that. It's coming because what Elijah does next just doesn't make sense in light of what he just saw. But in this moment, God is strengthening him. He is empowered by the Lord, even in his running. Joe Brown mentioned it's about 25 miles, so he's running this marathon, and he outruns a chariot. It is a miracle of God, even in that little thing. Well, I want us to be understanding that there are numerous opinions, um, but there is only one singular, extraordinary truth. I didn't say extraordinary truths. Singular. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus Christ said. But we need to be thinking about this even in our world today in regards to religions and deities. That there aren't numerous opinions, there's one truth. It's not find your way up the mountain, every way will get there. It's not a universalist perspective. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. It's, it's not some other route that God will applaud you. If that's true, then Jesus didn't need to die on the cross. He died on there because he had to. He asked in the garden if he could let this cup pass from him, remember? And, and God didn't let it pass because he had to die. But also we need to apply this to our lives in regards to morals and ethics. There are many opinions on what we should do and how we should do it and what does the Bible teach or not teach in church. I would encourage you to study the passages that seem confusing. Because there are multiple perceptions of the truth, but there's only one truth. There's only one perspective that God has on sexuality, that he has on marriage, that he has on our ethics in the world today. And I would ask you to be like Bereans who challenge every thought to the scriptures of the word of God because he has given it to us for that purpose. The Holy Spirit can convict us. But church, what does God's word say about this? As I'm parenting my children and they want to watch this movie, what does God's word say about this? As I'm deciding what what to do in my time off or how late to stay up and watch that show or what to watch on my phone or what game to play or who to visit for coffee when my wife's out of town. I mean, these are things that we need to run through the lens of Scripture because, church, God does have an opinion that is true, a perspective and authority that he is above all things, that his word matters. (laughs) 
We don't like to hear it because it's often offensive. Jesus said, count the cost. Die to yourself daily. But church, it is for our best. God's words on sexuality and on marriage are keeping people from the pain of disobedience that they're finding to be true. I'm going to go there because it's a sensitive subject, but I don't know anybody that says that they went through a divorce without pain. The Bible says God hates divorce. And it's painful. It, it hurts. It hurts the children that are there. It hurts the couples that are torn apart. It is painful, and God does not want it. We say it from a vow, until death do us part. That is God's ideal situation. There are situations that God understands, that God responds to with his grace and his mercy. But God's ways are for our best. His laws are not to restrict us, but to protect us. Do you believe it even this morning? Let me finish by looking at this passage because this is where I think the world is today. In Judges chapter 2, I'll read it off the screen for time. Uh, Joshua dies in verse 8. And then continuing on in verse 10, it says that all the generations also were gathered to their fathers, the generation of Joshua. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done in Israel. This is the danger. This is why Adam's work with the youth are so important. This is why our children's ministry is so important, because we need generations to not be neglectful or ignorant of the Lord. Why? Because look what happens. In verse 11, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They served the Baals, and they abandoned the Lord their God, their father, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went after other gods, from whom the gods of the people who were around them, and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherah. A church, in the very last verse of this book of Judges, they don't do what's evil in the sight of the Lord, though that's true. Look how it ends. In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is how far Israel had fallen from the Lord. I'm going to be so bold to say this is how far America has fallen from the Lord. Amen. This is how far humanity has fallen from the Lord, that it's not just doing what's evil in the sight of the Lord, it's doing what's right in my own eyes. The conviction of evil in the hearts of people is not as strong as it used to be. I mean, I'll take pornography as an example. There was a day and age where you had to walk into a certain store, enter behind a black curtain, and walk out with a paper bag around a magazine and pay at a cash register and let everybody see that you were doing that. But now you can just spend a little bit more time on your phone. You can just stay at your office for your lunch break on the computer. I mean, it's no longer evil in the sight of the world because the world doesn't even know that it's happening, but it's right in my own eyes. Church, there are things that we do in darkness that we do because we enjoy it, because it seems what's best. That is a dangerous thing for our world to fall into. Because when my what's best seems to be taking what's yours, you're not going to want me to do what's best in my eyes. <laughs> Because what's right in my eyes is not right in your eyes. Church, we need a foundation of truth for our culture to survive. Amen. Divided, the house will not stand. <laughs> I even have a hard time saying uh, United States of America because I don't know that we are. I mean, I want it to be. <laughs> but this world is darkening. Yes. Which should happen in the chaos of no structure of truth. But with truth, with God as our structure, we will withstand the storms of life. Let's pray. Father God, we come. We bow. We declare that we need you. We say thank you for giving us your word. We wouldn't know who you were or what you desire of us if it weren't for the word you've given to us. But God, even the reality of the Bible withstanding the times, those that have tried to take it away and snuff it out, God, the fact that the Bible and the words of God still change lives today, the fact that the Holy Spirit brings conviction that we do something that's wrong and we know it's wrong, but we don't know why, and Lord, we see that it aligns with what you tell us in your word. There are laws in this land that we would say are built on the Christian principles, but really, God, 
There are laws of faith, hope, and love upon which nobody says is wrong. (laughs) That treating others well is not something that is unique. It is biblical. It is image-bearer logical. It is what we are called to do and called to be. So God, I pray that this morning that you would stir in us to test the truth. If we don't believe it's true, Lord, may us may we take it to examination. And Lord, for those of us that believe it to be true, may, it, may, may we believe that it will withstand the testing of the culture around us, that the co-workers that laugh at our face for what we did on a Sunday morning, or the family who laughs at us when we bow our head for prayer before we eat, or the people that challenge the foolishness of our faith, God, may we believe that you look on us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. May we believe that there is coming a day where we will receive our reward of eternal life with you, not wanting to perish, be separated you forever. God, I pray that you'd awaken people to the seriousness of this reality, that we can't go without a decision. Stir in us to understand that truth does demand a decision. Help us to decide even today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.